Thank you. Tomorrow, uh, right after I minister, I'll have to leave because I have a flight at 1.30. So if there is anybody who wants any of the other books, I would suggest you get them tonight. And if you do need a square, uh, we could we do have a square to pay with the uh, credit card. So thank God for this special day and, and being here uh, with all of you and just having a fellowship, getting to know you, and having a, you know, a family here and all over the world. And it's just an amazing blessing that we can have one another. It's just really, really special. And we thank God that uh, uh, now Bishop Emaniki, he just has uh, such a great heart for people and influence all over the world. And uh, what an amazing family they have, which to me impresses me more than their ministry. Uh, to me, it's easy to have a ministry. It's easy to get people healed. Yes. It's not easy to raise a family. So if you can raise a family, that means in, in Christ, that means you're really walking that out in, in reality. So that means they see their parents seeking God. They see their parents in their relationship. Uh, they see them praying and believing God through crises, believing God for money. They see them handling crises and stress, and they are on fire They're serving God. I mean, what more can you get than that? So to me, that's the greatest emblem of their service, more than any title, more than any uh, healings or anointing or anything, is, is their family. So uh, let's just thank God for their family right now. Judith has as much as anything to do with, with the success of the ministry and the family. So, uh, you know, we just thank God for you, Judith. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Me and my wife have seen so much nonsense, you know, being in church ministry for almost 40 years. And we don't have a lot of people that we really look up to or, you know, we, we do have a lot of close friends. I don't want to say we don't. We have a lot of great ministers we work with. But, you know, we're, we're not fooled, to put it that way. We have a lot of discernment. We're streetwise, brought up in the streets of New York City, as well as, you know, being prophetic. And so we really believe they're the real deal. So, you know, otherwise I wouldn't flew out. I don't, see, I don't minister for numbers or for offerings. I minister because of relationships. That's why I minister. You know, some relationships, um, it's because I'm building with them a ministry or a network. They're part of our movement. Or some, it's just relational. So that's why I'm here, because of the relationship. Not if two people showed up, it wouldn't matter, because I'm here for them. I'm not here for anything else. So that's how I operate. So anyway, I do teach a lot of other things besides the kingdom. I want you to know that. <laughs> and, uh, you go on my website, you see articles on you know a lot of different things. And then, of course, as a pastor, I have to teach. This this Sunday, for example, we're going through the whole book of Luke. So I'm dealing now with uh, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who serves. So I'm teaching on that. Um, and we have a preaching team. I only preach like 25% of the time but because I travel so much. But... The point is, when I do travel, I will teach a lot on the kingdom because I feel like it's the most needed because it's not what you get the most. But just so that you know, that's not the only thing I teach you. Um, so what I want to do is, uh, let me just get this thing set up. What did Paul the Apostle do without all these gadgets? I don't know. So Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you, God, that you have called us by your name into the kingdom for such a time as this. And we thank you, God, that you want us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, did anyone here ever see the movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Do you know what that movie's about? What I want to teach on tonight is, honey, I shrunk the gospel. <laughs> honey, I shrunk the gospel. And this will be coming out in another book. You know, I already finished it, so we're working on the editing right now. 
But um, basically, as you heard me speak already, that my view of the kingdom is the rule of God that emanates from the throne of God. So that means the kingdom of God encompasses everything. Then as we apply that to um, culture, apply to the church, apply to our own life, there's more of a manifestation of the alignment of the kingdom. That's when people submit to the lordship of Christ. And that's what Jesus meant when he said to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as it is in heaven means that the alignment is a lot more than just God's sovereignty. Because in the conceptual framework of the kingdom, the devil is even in the kingdom of God. Because he has to receive permission before he tempts anybody, according to Job chapter 1 and 2. But what we're talking about is when people submit to the Lordship of Christ and when systems are changed because of that. And that is something even deeper than the sovereign government of God. That is as it is in heaven. And one of the things I realized was that, and I was just blown away by this. I don't understand how all the years, for 17 years, I was reading the Bible and never saw this. The main theme of the New Testament is the kingdom of God. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then it describes Paul's <laughs> preaching in many places in the book of Acts as to things concerning the kingdom. Even the last sentence of the book of Acts has a framework of summary of Paul's ministry of what? The things concerning the kingdom. So that being said, how in the world is it that hardly anyone preaches on it? Nowadays, it's being taught more and more. But for many, many years, I'll be honest with you, when I was uh, in 1995, at that point, I'd never heard anybody preach on it except in a seminar. And it had to do with when John Wimber was doing his power encounters and he was teaching the kingdom of God manifest in, in signs and wonders. But signs and wonders are only signs of the kingdom. It is not necessarily an implementation of the kingdom. The implementation is when people submit to the Lordship of Christ personally and change their world around them. And of course, we also have to understand that only transformed people can transform the kingdom. So anything I'm teaching does not negate the need for fasting and prayer for revival, for living a holy life. Because if you're not transformed, you are not going to do any transforming. So to me, that's the first requirement is our own walk with God. And that's why Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you in Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Which means that we cannot force the kingdom by politics and by economics. Satan will try to change the environment through force. That's why you have Marxism. That's why you have all these isms, communism and socialism. They try to bring a utopia. They try to bring a, a, a paradise on earth through forcing the redistribution of wealth by high taxation, progressive taxation and forcing uh, equality through law, and they think that this is going to bring some kind of utopia. It's not. Uh, you can never force the kingdom. You can never force a paradise because you have to change the human heart. And so the human heart is where God's kingdom starts. The kingdom of God always starts from inside and works its way outside. Marxism and all these other isms start from the outside and they try to change the inside. It doesn't work. So that's the big difference. We can never legislate the kingdom. We can never force the kingdom. We can't force conversions. The best thing we could do is live the life of being like Christ and then seeing of people around us saved and then seeing the kingdom of God impact their surroundings. And then uh, we'll see the kingdom of God manifest. And so the kingdom of God is the main theme of the word of God. And I don't want to downgrade or negate the fact that it's not just changing in the heart. There is a place for systems changing because 
systems are in uh, are unjust a lot of times. Jesus talked about the way that he wanted to minister was starting with the poor and then working his way to changing cities based on Isaiah 61. So one of the greatest proofs of the gospel is not just an individual getting saved, but it's when the gospel affects a whole community. When a church sees a whole community breaking the spirit of poverty, breaking the spirit of crime and the epidemics that are going on, and seeing a tremendous quality of life transformation. So when the kingdom of God takes hold and it really moves and there are disciples in church, it will result in the transformation of their families, of their businesses, of their environment and of the community. If a church is supposedly very powerful but you don't see any systemic change around them, then it's not really walking in the fullness of the kingdom. So there always has to be a systemic change to prove the gospel, to prove the power of the gospel. And that's why you could have mega churches with no influence. Because if all they do is preaching individual salvation, they have shrunk the gospel. And they have shrunk the gospel in such a way so that it's only good enough for an individual to make it to heaven. But it's not good enough to change an environment. And there have been many revivals. I mean, we could get into, there's a message I teach on why revival is not enough. Um, actually, my book, Ruling in the Gates, really focuses on that. And it's amazing how even historically we see the Pentecostal revivals of the 20th century never change culture, never touch culture. The Azusa Street revival never changed America, never changed nations. It changed individuals, denominations formed and all that but nothing else. The Voice of Healing movement never, ever touched the culture. The charismatic movement, the most powerful movement in the 20th century, moved in every denomination. Everybody got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Never touched culture. That took place around the same time as the sexual re revolution. Never stopped the sexual revolution. Why? Because if you don't have the kingdom message, if you don't have a biblical worldview, you can get filled with the Holy Ghost and still perpetuate a Babylonian system. The Word of Faith movement never touched culture. The prophetic and megachurch movement in the 80s never touched culture. There have been hundreds of thousands of people activated in the prophetic, never touched culture. Um, you know, supposedly the restoration of the apostolic in the 1990s, that was a real big thing, the new apostolic reformation. People thought once that took place, nations would come in. I'm still waiting for that to happen. You could have the title and you could even have the fruit. That doesn't mean nations going to come. If you don't walk out the kingdom. So uh, we cannot do justice to uh, God's kingdom if we shrink the gospel. You could be a real apostle, but if you're shrinking the gospel, you'll just have influence and have to stop fruit in the church realm. But you're going to limit the realm of, of that office if you're not turning the world upside down. And that's what we have to understand. And so you could go to nations where most of the people are born again, and there's systemic crime, homicides, lead the world in AIDS. There's a lack of, uh, uh, you know, one country I go to, uh, Uganda, I've been going there for years. And um, I stopped going a few years ago, where I don't have a release right now, but I was going two or three times a year, ministering to 2,200 pastors, uh, the head bishop wanted to give me his network of 2,200, and I said to him, no. I said, I don't live here. I don't need another 2,200 churches to look good in my portfolio. As a matter of fact, they put me in front of 100 of the top leaders in their city of Kampala, and I was with a, uh, two other Europeans who had a vision for Africa, and they wanted me to share my vision for Africa. So I said, well, let them go first. So this first person went and said, well, I need 75 pastors, and I want them to help me evangelize Africa, and I want them to, you know, support my ministry and work with me. Then the next person got up and shared their vision for Africa. When I got up, I said, I have no vision for Africa. <laughs> and I was just quiet for two minutes, and the head bishop was like nervous, and probably was sorry he asked me to come to this meeting. And I just let him, you know, foment inside. People were looking around, shocked. Oh, wow. And 
then after two minutes, I said, I don't have a vision. You have a vision for Africa. I said, I'm not here to take your churches. I'm not here to get pastors in my network. I'm not here to plant churches. You have enough apostolic leaders here. I'm here to wash your feet. The only thing I can do is give you advice, teach you biblical principles. You are the one who has a vision for Africa. God's not going to bypass you and give me a vision for your city. I said, that's, that's uh, colonialism. I said, that's the same... I don't I want to watch my language. The same garbage that took place in the 18th and 19th century, the church is still doing it today. You know, we come with our Western values. We have to take over. We have the money. We have a, come on now, that's all nonsense. That's paternalism. I don't plant churches and I don't receive pastors in other countries. I would only do it if the gospel is never preached in an area. If a pastor wants to join our network, I tell them, no, you have apostles here in your own city. Mm -hmm. I'll take apostles, but I won't take pastors. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm just so sick of the nonsense. I've had people trying to give me whole networks in India. I said, I don't live here. So if an apostle wants to join, I'll work with him. But I am not into inflate. I could, you know, I'm, if I was doing this stuff, I could have said I had 10,000 churches. And I, some people say we have 5,000 churches in our network. And I laugh and I say, but how many sons are you walking with? Right. That's right. That's right. How many sons do you have? Yes. God, because a lot of this stuff is a game, ecclesiastical circus and show. I don't mean. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so, when I was in Africa, I told them I have no vision, but I tell you, you have vision. I'm here to wash your feet. That's what I'm here to do. And I said, God is not going to bypass you because I come from America. I'm going to have a vision for Africa. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, I honor the leaders wherever I go. I'm there to wash their feet. I don't have apostolic authority in other countries. I only have the authority that's given to me by the person who invites me. If they tell me to sit down, they don't agree with my teaching, I would sit right down. There's some people who say, I'm the apostle of America. I'm the apostle of Kenya. I'm the who do you think you are? You don't have any authority unless, you know, even Paul the apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, I can't even evangelize unless the church in Corinth is strong enough. He said, I can't go beyond the borders of where I am until the Lord extends my authority. So in other words, everybody has a metron of authority. I don't have this kind of authority in other countries. I could go as a prophet. I could go as a teacher. Going as an apostle because that's governmental. I'm not going. I could go as a bishop representing the church of uh, you know U.S., but I'm not a bishop in that country with the same governmental authority. Do you understand the difference? So we have to understand protocols in order. And a lot of people throw the titles around because they want more people in their network. It doesn't. Uh, it's a circus. And so what we have to do is we have to be really careful when we are walking in other countries, walking in other cities, we have to be humble, we have to respect the people that God has set and the authority that they represent. And that's what, you know, and, and, uh, and I don't want to usurp anybody's authority. I could have taken advantage of so many people. You know how many people, every week I get people wanting me to be their spiritual father. They email me. They're texting me. Everywhere I go, I preach. I want to be under your covering. I want, and I tell them, look, I don't even answer the emails. Mm -hmm. You want to be under my covering. What about the apostle that you're walking with? Mm -hmm. The people who invited you. I said, uh, or if somebody invites me somewhere, I'm not going to make my own deals. Right. I'm going to say, if you want me to come, you work through the guy who invited me. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. 
So to me, if we don't have honor, we don't have anything. I don't care what kind of gifts we have. I don't care what kind of abilities we have. I don't care how good we can preach. We can fleece the sheep. We can make a lot of money. We can get a lot of people giving us tithes. I mean, let me tell you something. It's all going to go down in flames if we don't build on precious stones. A lot of people are building on wood, hay, and stubble. If you're building on wood, hay, stubble, and straw, you can build a lot of houses. But it goes up in flames once the fire hits. And it doesn't last. So we're very, very careful. I don't allow everybody who wants to be in our network to join. We have to discern their spirit. There has to be a witness. A lot of times I don't even follow up on the call if I don't know them, being honest with you. Uh, I don't have the time in the day to do it unless the Lord has really shown me or we already, it was a relationship through somebody else. So we have to be very, very careful in what we do. Now, we have something called the United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. That's different. That's not for covering. That we, we allow marketplace leaders, we allow apostolic leaders, some are called bishops, some are just called pastors, some are just marketplace leaders. Yes, come one, come all. If you qualify, if you have apostolic fruit, you could join. It's an association. We represent tens of thousands of churches, and we only started about three years ago. Uh, we have a meeting in November, uh, an international gathering in Dallas, November 6th to the 9th. You can go on uscal.us and find out about that. Uh, yeah, we, we do represent, but it's not for covering. It's different. It's an association. It's not governmental. So that's different. We don't get people's tithes. We don't get people doing that. So uh, there's different ways of, of relating. So when we think about the kingdom of God, we think about the gospel, I don't, we have to understand there's a way of operating in the confines of the kingdom that bring God glory. So it's not just ministry, it's not just anointing, there's ethics, there's protocol, there's a way of living, a way of life that we need to uh, abide by, that God honors. And, uh, and so as we're thinking about this, I want to talk about ways we have shrunk the gospel in terms of the way we practice it and theology. How many understand what I'm saying so far? Okay, so I think I said this this morning, I was telling uh, Bishop Fred that, and Judith that, you know, the Bible says we go from glory to glory, but I feel like I'm going from conference to conference. <laughs> I've been in so many conferences the last two weeks, I don't remember what I said where. <laughs> I got to write notes to make sure I don't, you know, preach the same thing twice. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think I said this morning that the, uh, the gospel, um, and now I forgot what I was going to say, that's uh, <laughs> Exhibition A. I might have to start all over again. <laughs> Let's start all over again. Um, so we have shrunk the gospel, um, and another way you could word it would be that we've separated the gospel from the kingdom. And... What I did say this morning was, in the United States, after the Civil War, there were nine reasons why the church separated the gospel from the kingdom. It's in my book, Ruling in the Gates, one chapter, nine reasons why the church stopped preaching the kingdom, uh, abandoned culture. One of them was the horrors of the Civil War, where they saw 600,000 men killed. And they said, how are we gonna preach the kingdom of God? We don't believe it's ever gonna come. So they went from the kingdom to and in, in engaging the earth to escaping the earth. So the theology of the church was changed, not from Bible study, but from circumstances. And you would be shocked as to how people's views of the last days or eschatology are really based on in the environment, not on theology. A lot of times that's the case. So the church began doing that and Around 1880, we stopped preaching the kingdom of God. We started focusing on the rapture and the mark of the beast, on all this other stuff. And by the way, the, the teaching of the rapture, the way it is taught today, was not known in church history until 1823. It came from a vision of a woman in the meeting of Edward Irving, a charismatic who spoke in tongues in the 18th, uh, 19th century. 
and uh, she had a vision of a rapture and actually took root in Edward Irving's church and wound up becoming mainstream and adopted by what we would call hybrid dispensationalists like J.N. Darby um, and others in the 1880s and people like D.L. Moody made it popular. He was a world famous evangelist and he started preaching it. That the way people teach the last days today was unknown in church history for 1800 years. I used to think the writings of Hal Lindsey were mainstream. No, no, that was odd. It's, it was called Chileism. It was never accepted, it was never mainstream, and even the way they taught the rapture was never, ever accepted, uh, never even known. And so, because of the horrors of the Civil War, the United States Church adopted this teaching on the rapture. They became rapture obsessed, and within 40 years, the, all the institutions of higher learning were taken over by the humanists. It just didn't bear any good fruit. And that's one of the things that brought me into the kingdom message because I do study church history. When I saw that, I said, wow, this did not bear good fruit. So this hyper-dispensational focus on the rapture must not be of God. And I started really studying and it opened me up to other views on eschatology that I didn't even know existed. And, uh, and then I came into the kingdom message. So I came through studying church history uh, more than anything else. And so we lost all the institutions of higher learning by the 1920s. We went from engaging the earth to escaping the earth because of the horrors of the Civil War. And there were about eight other reasons, Darwinism, Marxism, Freudism, um, higher critical teachings of the Bible by the German theologians, there was a confluence of nine movements that took place starting in the 1850s that just battered the church. And they got so shocked that they actually became insulated from culture, they abandoned culture, and they came up with a theology to justify it, that is the rapture. And so they went from engaging to escaping, and now we're reaping the fruits of that horrible escape. And uh, even when I was growing up in the church, well, I didn't grow up in, I got saved in 19, but uh, when I first got saved, there were people who left New York because they said Jesus is coming. They <laughs> left their ministry. They moved upstate hanging out with cows and sheep. And their ministry went down the tomb. Kids didn't go to college. People didn't plan long term. They didn't plan generationally. They didn't invest money in property. They didn't invest their money because Jesus is coming any day now. And all we got to do is win souls and, 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 you know, the rapture's coming. And, uh, you know, even my pastor was preaching that, you know, we were going to probably have a war with Russia really soon. And I remember even Benny Hinn said 1984, Haley's Comet was going to come. And that might be the beginning. He said it may be. He didn't say it would, I think. But that would be the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Something like Some kind of thing. And he wasn't the only one. Every, everybody was saying that kind of stuff. He's a great teacher, Benny Hinn. But, you know, in that area, I think... He was making a bit of a mistake. So I was surrounded with this kind of teaching, and everybody stopped thinking generationally. Well, you know, we have this escapism, and we've reaped the benefits of it, which is no benefit at all, the consequences. And uh, so unfortunately, when America sneezes, the whole world gets a cold. And when the U.S. abandoned the gospel of the kingdom, it spread all over the earth, all over the earth spread to England, and then it went all to the English Empire and everywhere. Unbelievable. But God is now reclaiming that in the church, the gospel of the kingdom. So the first consequence of shrinking the gospel is that we abandon our call to steward the earth. And we already went over that a lot this morning. Genesis 128, the key passage, scholars call it the cultural mandate covenant of creation where God called Adam to go into all of creation to subdue it and have dominion. He said uh, all of the earth, everything, the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, there were no nations, so he was talking about the created order. Once we shrug the gospel, we abandon the culture and it will be as if Adam stayed in the Garden of Eden, in a place of safety where you know, we have the four walls of a church, we have a nice church choir, we have a nice movement of spirit, and we just do everything in a safe place. That's what we've done, we've abandoned culture. And we focus our energy on the activities in a building. 
The second thing that happens, and uh, you can see the prominence of this kind of stuff all over America and all over the earth. Um, we, when we shrunk the gospel, we made the gospel narcissistic, self-focused. Narcissism is when somebody is very self-focused. They're very thinking, they're just thinking of themselves. They're thinking of their own needs, their own pleasure. I don't know if you've ever been around people like that. Uh, I remember one time I was with a, someone I thought was a close friend, and I was pouring my heart out. And instead of ministering to me, they turned the whole thing around and said, yeah, I've gone through the same thing. And then for the next hour, they would tell me their problems. And I said to myself, narcissism. I needed the help, but then I had to turn from being a friend to a pastor. <laughs> and I had to forget about my own needs, and I never again went there with that person. So, um, and you could see what has happened. When we shrunk the gospel, we took the purpose of the kingdom away from people. Now, every kingdom has economics. Every kingdom has politics. Every kingdom has education. Every kingdom has a social order that serves the people. Can you imagine being in a nation or a kingdom that doesn't have structure? It doesn't have systems. It doesn't have economics. doesn't have politics. Can you imagine? Well, when Jesus talks about the kingdom, he's implying that he has a way of dealing with life in systems. God has a view of politics. God has a view of economics. God has a view of culture. Right? So... When we separated the gospel from the kingdom and or we shrunk the gospel, what has happened is we took the kingdom away and now we're left with just a good news for ourselves. The gospel means good news. So we're left with a self-focused gospel. The only thing we want is to go to heaven. See, when you connect the gospel to the kingdom, you obligate people to serve humanity. You have to think, how does the gospel apply to my community? Because every kingdom has politics, economics, education, philosophy, music, art, and entertainment, science, right? So every kingdom has that by implication. So when we stop preaching it, we don't have a kingdom. We just have good news for ourselves. And that's why wherever you go all over the world, the preaching is about I, me, mine. How you could be happy. Seven steps to your healing. How you could be self-fulfilled. Why God wants you happy. Why God wants you fed. This is people go to church to get fed, to get slain in the spirit, to get a word, to feel good, to get entertained, to hear good music, to hear good preaching. People shout amen and psychologically they think they've done it in the same way when they watch a movie, they think they've lived it. It's entertainment. If they live through the preacher, and the preacher says something they like, they shout amen. <laughs> amen is a covenantal word. It means that I make a covenant to do what you just said. Amen. People in our church don't say amen that much because they're making a covenant. They're going to do what was just preached. But today we say out amen because we feel like we've done it because we agree with it. It's a psychological phenomenon. That's why men love sports. They have a boring life, so they have to watch football all day. Come on. Because they have no purpose, so they need somebody else to have a sense of destiny to win or lose because they don't do it. Right? And so when people shout amen, it's as if they've done it. And so we went from theology to therapy in the church. And now everything is about self-fulfillment and meeting your needs and motivational messages. And now we've been so seeker sensitive, we have one hour of 15 minute meetings with 15 minute sermonettes. They should have just become chaplains. Like, you know, sports chaplains. They give a 10 minute rah-rah message. That's why we don't have disciples. So we got a bunch of babies running around People saying they have great churches because they have 15,000 people. And meanwhile, if you put a gun to their head, they couldn't give you four verses on knowing God's attributes. They couldn't tell you about the government of God. They couldn't tell you about 
anything other than wow. one or two verses on prosperity or healing. Wow, that's true. That's good. We become narcissistic. Yeah. Once we start preaching the gospel of the kingdom, we obligate people to get out of their own world and start thinking how they're going to apply the gospel to their surroundings. Here's another thing that happens when we shrunk the gospel. Biblical prosperity becomes about individual blessing yes. instead of spreading his covenant. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, God told Moses, I've given you power to get wealth. Why? So you can have a nice chariot? So you can live high off the hog? He said, I've given you power to get wealth so that you can confirm my covenant on the earth. When you combine the gospel of the kingdom, you realize that God wants to give you wealth so that you can build his kingdom, so that you can serve your community, so that you can serve humanity, so that you it's, it's beyond you, so you can bring God's covenant, God's gospel to the earth. But when we took the kingdom of God, it was good news for ourselves. So now I name and claim a plane for myself. I name and claim it a nice car. I name it and claim it so I can have a good house. Everything's about me. Everything's about my prosperity. Everything's about my benefit. And I came out of the Word of Faith movement, and I love Brother Hagin and learned so much from him. And he was not unbalanced, but so many other people have taken his teachings and been a little unbalanced. But then it got even worse. I don't follow a lot of this stuff. But when I go in some places, man, it's been so twisted, Brother Hagin wouldn't even recognize it. I mean, he just, he, he's, what in the world do you preach? As a matter of fact, a few years before he passed away, he had a meeting with a lot of Word of Faith preachers, and he tried to get them to understand the balance. That's uh, his book, Minus Touch, is about. So we have to understand that if we separate the gospel from the kingdom, we're left with a narcissistic gospel that then leads to prosperity just being about us, just to benefit us. And we miss the, the fact that God has given us wealth to confirm his covenant and is an obligation to serve him and his kingdom with it. Uh, you can't separate virtue from money in the kingdom. There's no way you can do that. Here's another one. When we separate the gospel, when we shrink the gospel, or separate it from the kingdom, we interpret every passage just for ourselves. We individualize scripture. Again, when you preach the gospel of the kingdom, it connects you to the larger body of Christ. It connects you to what God is doing in the earth, because it's God's rule across the earth. It gets you out of yourself. And nowadays, every Verse in the Bible is our little promise. I don't want to burst your bubble, but the Bible was not written just for you individually. Matter of fact, you have a bunch of people running around that don't even go to church claiming the scriptures for themselves. And that was foreign to the Hebraic mindset because if you lived in the days of Paul the Apostle, you didn't have a Bible. Matter of fact, until the Gutenberg Press in 1517, nobody had Bibles. Very few people had a whole Bible. You had to be very rich or you had to be a cleric, clergy. And so they walked around with letters. And the only ones that had the letters were the head of the synagogue or the head of the church. And they, you know, they passed these letters that were handwritten around. That's all they had. So when you heard a promise in the Word of God, like Philippians, 1, 6, it says, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. The average Christian today claims that for themselves, whether or not they're functioning in a local church. Mm -hmm. I heard people say the Bible is God's personal love letter to you. Show me that in the Bible. God's personal love letter. It's a covenantal document, legally and binding. It's given to the church at large. And it will only benefit you if you're walking in the midst of that church, of the body. And so you wouldn't have even known Philippians 1, 6 existed in the context of that letter if you weren't in the Philippian church when they read it. So 
you would have never dreamed of interpreting he who began a good work in you to yourself. That was written to the church, meaning you can apply it to yourself if you're in the Philippian church. Does that make sense? So we have a bunch of people walking around. It's just them and the Holy Spirit in their Bibles because we've shrunk the gospel. Philippians 4.19, it says, um, and my God shall supply all my needs. And I heard people preach on that. In the context of people claiming it for themselves. And they never ever brought out a local church. Well, in order to interpret the Bible properly. And I spent several years studying hermeneutics. Because that's the most important thing to me. In order to understand the Bible, there's two things I think everybody has to do. Number one, make believe there are no chapters and verses. Man put chapters and verses in. That's not inspired by God. Chapters and verses decontextualize scripture, and it gives you the propensity to isolate a verse, and that's how cults start. Make believe it's one flowing letter. That's number one. It'll change your Bible. If you make believe chapters and verses aren't there. The number, they're good just to memorize scripture and to find them, but they're not good for interpreting it. Right. Number two, you have to understand the context. Yes. Number three, you have to understand the author's original intent when he wrote it. Preachers tend to impose their spiritual insight on the text before they bring out the author's original intent. First, before we hear your insight, before we hear what the Spirit is telling you, before you impose your culture, before you impose your opinion, before you opine, before you impose your views on the text of Scripture, first tell me what Paul meant when he wrote Philippians 1 6. Tell me what Moses meant. That does some work. You got to do historical, cultural examinations. You might have to read a commentary. You might have to do a little more work than just getting your little subjective impression from the Holy Spirit, which we don't even know if it's true or not. So the first thing you should do, tell us what Paul meant. So if you do that in Philippians 4.19, he says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, if you read the context, it was Philippians 1.3. He said, I thank God for your partnership in the gospel. That yeah. meant they gave him moolah. Come on. The church gave him money and supported his apostolic ministry. And then in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I thank God uh, that you remembered me, uh, that you sowed it to me, that you participated in, in, in giving and receiving, because you always receive from God. You never just give. So the context of Philippians 4.19 was the church of Philippi sowed money. They took an offering for Paul as a church. And then in response, Paul prophesied, my God shall supply all you need. You can't claim that for yourself if you're not working, walking with a church. It can only be applied to you if you are corporately giving through a church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, God can do whatever he wants. You're somewhere in the Amazon jungle. You're not near a church. You can apply certain things to yourself. Of course, I'm not being legalistic, but if you want to really understand how this stuff works, you cannot separate the promises of God from its context. And the context in both the Old and New Testament is always... There. Let me just say this. Everything in the Old Testament was written to the nation of Israel or a nation. Everything written in the New Testament is written to the body of Christ or, you know, the church of the city. Very rarely was things written to individuals. And even if it was written to individuals, it had to do with their calling to the church. It was never just for themselves. We've turned the whole thing around. Everything's just for me. Everything's just for me. Whether I'm in a church, whether I'm corporately involved, whether I'm doing God's will, as long as it's for me. And that's how we live. Everything's about me. I mean my, the false trinity. Because we've shrunk the gospel. We have shrunk the gospel. We separate from the kingdom. And it leads to individualism, hyper-individualism. And I believe you have, 
I think there's about 30 million Christians in the United States that don't even go to church. Right. Why? Because they don't think they need it because it's all the individualistic preaching they've heard. You can't even blame them. you got to blame the people who preach. I remember one time this guy was telling me he had a national speaker come to his church. And uh, he said 10,000 people came. And I said, so what happened? He said, well, everybody was running around claiming their destiny. And I said to him, let me ask you a question. Be totally honest with me. Did it help your church or hurt your church? And he thought, he said, huh, I don't even know. I said, you know what, it probably hurt your church. I said, because they're claiming individual destiny without submitting to spiritual authority, without knowing they're supposed to operate through the context of the church. They're claiming vision without understanding corporate vision. They think they could have their own life, their own vision, their own ministry disconnected from the church. And that's why you have so many church hoppers, church shoppers, and they have no clue how to operate in the kingdom of God. Here's another thing that happens. When we shrink the gospel, we win the hearts, but lose the minds of the next generation. Not too many old enough to remember this, but in the 1960s and 70s, there was the Jesus movement. I got saved in the tail end of that. A lot of hippies got saved. Hundreds of thousands of young people got saved. Especially in the, it started I think in San Francisco, Height Street, and just moved all around. And it did a lot of great things. It forced the church to come up with contemporary music because before that you weren't allowed to have instruments in church. We just sang a cappella with hymnals. So to relate to these rockers, we began Christian rock music. Um, then we began dressing down a lot of times in the church. You couldn't go to church if you didn't wear a suit and a tie. I remember ministering to people in the street that said that they were thrown out of church because they didn't have a suit and a tie on. So these hippies forced them to contextualize the culture and allow them to come in with hats on and dirty jeans, you know. And so it made the, the gospel more relevant and it made it a little more seeker sensitive. But because we didn't preach the full gospel and we shrunk the gospel, we lost an incredible opportunity. If we had taught the kingdom of God, we would have given these young people a biblical worldview. And a lot of them that got saved, they have Bibles, they're going to heaven, but they never had a biblical worldview. They went on to go to universities. They went on to become our leaders. And I found that we don't have a lack of Christians in government and in politics, we have a lack of Christian thinking. A lot of these young people perpetuate a pagan system, yeah. even though on Sunday they're worshiping God and going to heaven. So they right. never taught the biblical worldview, never taught the kingdom of God. So we won their hearts, we won their emotions, but their minds were discipled by the universities. That's it, right? That's it. And the word of God teaches us the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our mind. In charismatic churches, we put our mind outside when we come into the church. We think it's just about emotion and hype. Do you hear what I'm saying? But we are called to love God with our mind. As a matter of fact, using reason. God said, let us reason together. Jesus constantly reasoned with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He tried to get people to think. There's no separation between the gospel and logic. And yet we have separated the gospel from the kingdom. We've shrunk it. And because of that, we think science is the enemy of religion. I mean, there's so much stuff we could talk about, which I don't want to get into. But what we have done is we lost the opportunity to not only win the hearts of these young people, but disciple their minds. No, we won their hearts, but their minds were discipled by secular humanists. And these people became our leaders. Here's another thing. 
we all these points lead to another point. When we shrunk the gospel, we missed the opportunity to disciple many emerging leaders of our nation. I'll give you a hypothetical story to illustrate the point. Can you imagine if Steve Jobs was alive today? Make believe Steve Jobs, the co-creator of Apple, everybody would agree has an incredible imagination, um, call to change the world. Can you imagine if an 18-year-old Steve Jobs woke up one day and said, I feel like I'm supposed to change the world. I feel like I'm, I have a real creative gift that's gonna impact everybody. Um, how am I gonna know how to use it? Well, maybe I should connect with my creator. So he says to himself, let me, how am I gonna find this creator? Let me go to church. So can you imagine if Steve Jobs went to a typical Pentecostal church in America or in Africa or Latin America, you just name it, to find out how to use his gifts in the earth. And he went to a service and the pastor was preaching on the rapture. 18 year old Steve Jobs. I want to learn how to use my gift to impact the world and this guy is talking about escaping the earth. He said, well, let me try coming again. The second week, the guy was talking about the mark of the beast and the Antichrist. <laughs> the third week, he's talking about the great tribulation because of the blood moon and, and whatever else, hurricanes. Every time there's a natural disaster, there's someone else writing a book on the last days. <laughs> Unbelievable. And they're all making money. And I don't want to get into it, but... Even recently with these hurricanes, if somebody wrote an article, is this a sign of the last days of Jesus coming any day now? I just can't take it anymore. I've been going through this for almost 40 years. Can you imagine how Jesus feels? His people have been talking about this for 2,000 years. Every generation thinks they're the last generation. Enough already. He comes back, he comes back, but don't you think that everything that happened, it's like your generation is the important one because you're in it. No. That is so true. Oh, my God. You should get a book by Gary DeMar called Last Day's Madness. It'll really rock your world. He really gives a bit of history of this and challenge your eschatology, too, on that, that front. But anyway, uh, so as we... Uh, think about this. So Steve Jobs goes to church to find out how to use his creativity. First week, teaching on the rapture. The second week, the mark of the beast. And the third week, we're entering the great tribulation soon. And he's thinking, I want to learn how to use my gifts. And this guy is talking about how not to use my gifts, how to just live for heaven. How many know the Bible is not a book about heaven? It says very little about heaven. I know the word of God better than most average people, I'd say. Maybe not better than most pastors, but most average people. And I will say that from my recollection, there's not that much about heaven. It talks about eternal life, but eternal life starts now. It doesn't start in heaven. So why are we talking about heaven so much? And so instead of learning how to use his gifts on the earth, He's being taught to prepare for heaven. We lost Steve Jobs. I believe, even though that's a hypothetical story, we've lost the greatest emerging leaders in the last 150 years, the greatest leaders the world has ever seen have, have come and gone in our churches. And because we didn't give them a biblical worldview, they've been discipled by secular humanism because secular humanism presented comprehensive, consistent, uh, cohesive worldview, even though it wasn't true, but it made sense. Christianity doesn't make sense when you separate from the gospel. It doesn't comport with human experience. It doesn't give us, it doesn't speak to the sense of purpose of dominion God has put in all of us. It doesn't realize our and actualize our gifts. So we've lost emerging leaders Another thing that happens, I believe, I can't prove this, but in my opinion, I believe 
or we had shrunk the gospel, we attract less men in the church. Less men. Why? Because before God gave Adam a wife, he was tilling the garden. Genesis chapter 2. Right? Like around verse 12. That means man receives his primary identity through what he does for a living. It's very difficult psychologically to disconnect a man from his work. That's why when a man retires and doesn't do anything, he usually dies within a few years. Better let a man work himself to death than retire. And then it tells us that he gave Adam that command to till the ground. Then he put him to sleep. And when God put Adam to sleep, you know, I know our Bible says he took from his rib. The actual Hebrew is he took from Adam's side. That means God split the Adam. Took the femininity out of him and created a woman. And that's why a man is attracted to a woman and a woman to a man because God took femininity out of a man. And so a man sees what he's missing in a woman and a woman sees what she's missing in a man. That's why this transgender stuff is so crazy, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> there is a difference, scientifically, psychologically, and physiologically, between a man and a woman. But we have to have mercy and love and pray for those who are struggling and not make fun of them. So I'm not making fun of them, but I'm just saying it's not a biblical thing, put it that way. So we need to pray for them. But the point is, we understand that a man gets his primary identity through what he does for a living. And then after that, God gave him a woman. A woman tends to get more of her identity from her relationships because she was made after Adam to be a complement to him. So that's why usually men tend to be unbalanced when it comes to work and you need a woman to balance them to make them have more time with the family. Mm. That's a natural thing. Um, so what is my point? My point is when we took the gospel, when we shrunk the gospel and we took it away from the kingdom, we took away from the gospel the connection to the first covenant of having dominion in the earth, working. Do you, you see that? God called us to subdue the earth, that's manly, to have dominion, to sanctify the earth. Men understand that whole genre. They, they, they are attracted to that. When we shrunk the gospel and made it just about us, just about our feelings, just about getting fed, I mean my gospel, a lot of men are bored in church. They cannot connect the dots. They don't understand what the purpose is. And a lot of times, even the services are there to accommodate women because most of the churches are female. Most of the churches I go to, 75% of the population is female. So what people do is they make it more emotional, they make it more sensitive, and a lot of the worship songs are what I would call bedroom worship, not throne room worship. You got a typical man who comes into church and he's hearing a song like, you know, Jesus kissed me with a sloppy wet kiss. And, uh, you know, uh, like the song of Solomon, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. And I'm, look, I'm into the bedroom worship because I'm in love with Jesus. I mean, I'm a mature believer. I'm like David. I can, I can do that. But the typical man comes in and that's all he hears. Let me tell you something. You are going to turn him on. I can't connect to this Jesus in that way. You know, what about the old hymn? Crown him with many crowns. You know? I mean, we proclaim that the kingdom of God is here. I mean, what happened to the old hymns? What happened to the God-focused hymns? What happened to the God-centered kingdom hymns? That's right. We're going to have to change a lot of the writing. We're going to have to change a lot of the songs. 
lot of these songs are so experiential that men can't connect. It's so emotional. And then you have whooping and crying and hollering and dancing for two hours, and then men can't handle that. <laughs> They're mature, they can handle it. So there's, if we're really going to get serious, I'm not saying we should have less women in the church. I am saying we have a crisis of manhood in the church. It is a crisis. It's an, ep it's an epidemic everywhere in the world, in New York. In America, in Africa, in Latin America, I don't know about China. I know in Yonggi Cho's church, he said that most of his cell group leaders were women. Uh, let me tell you that we have to get to a point where we stop shrinking the gospel. We, we start appealing to men. We start appealing to men. Um, and, my God... I'm just going to talk about one more point. I have, I have a whole bunch of them. I'm just trying to flow with the spirit. The last thing I'll cover, when we shrunk the gospel, we stopped impacting principalities and powers. We stopped impacting principalities and powers. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you read the book of Daniel, chapter 9, through to 11. You see, because Daniel was a prime minister and a prophet, he was a kingdom man. What he did influenced nations. He was a powerful, powerful prophet. A great, great model for us in a postmodern pagan culture. And Daniel, when he was praying for 21 days, fasting and praying, he was dealing with the prince of Greece the demonic power that was fighting with Mark Michael the Archangel that was trying to overthrow the Prince of Persia. So he was wrestling with all these things, right? Well, I contend that when we shrunk the gospel, because we're not preaching the kingdom, we're not threatening these principalities, we can cast demons out of individuals. We can cast demons out of the lowest level principalities don't even know you exist most of us they're the princes of the cities over nations Come on. Yeah. we're dealing now with individual demons mm -hmm. that come into people principalities don't come into people generally unless they're kings unless they're princes not just political leaders they could be celebrities they could be you know people with a lot of influence and so when we shrunk the gospel, we stopped dealing with these principalities because principalities and powers hide behind ideas, philosophy, and ideology. Principalities and powers influence politics, economics, social systems. That is to say, they influence ideologies. When you just preach an individual gospel, when you shrink the gospel, you no longer threaten them. Matter of fact, they don't care how many people get saved in your crusade because if those people continue to perpetuate a Babylonian system, it doesn't threaten their ideology. They're just going to heaven, but it doesn't threaten their rule in their kingdom. Do you see what I just said? But once we combine the gospel with the kingdom, we are threatening their ideology, we're threatening the worldview they hide behind. And there's so much I can say about this, but I will tell you this. If we dare preach the gospel of the kingdom without living a life of fasting and prayer, we're going to get killed. We're going to get our heads kicked in. Because you're going to walk into a level of spiritual warfare that's going to be beyond anything you've ever walked into. Because now you're getting the attention of principalities and powers. Because the two steering wheels of the world are politics and economics. If you touch that, blood gets spattered in the street. As long as you don't touch that, they don't care how many people get saved, to be quite honest with you, because they care about keeping their territory and their rule. Now, obviously, if you're getting people saved and you're making them disciples and they're turning the world <laughs> upside down, then you are 
scaring them, of course. Even if they don't understand the kingdom fully, you will scare them. Unfortunately, most people get saved, don't get discipled. So that's a whole other conversation. But assuming it's the way the contemporary church is going, just getting people saved doesn't necessarily threaten their rule because these people continue to perpetuate the same ungodly systems in every area of life except for going to heaven. Does that make sense? So once we start dealing with the kingdom, we better step up in our intercession. We better start getting more people corporately involved in fasting and praying. And um, I remember there was a time in, in my book, Travail to Prevail, actually tells the story. Uh, I spend a lot more time in prayer than I do reading. Um, I spend hours praying. I, I just wake up with a spirit of prayer in the morning. I have it. In the middle of the night, I have it. I have it throughout the day. Um, and I remember in 1998, the spirit of prayer came on me, January 2nd. And the spirit of prayer was so strong that I couldn't even have a conversation with anybody. It was just groans coming out of me. My spirit was weighted down. And, um, and for three to eight hours every day for the next three years, I prayed. And I remember I had to change my schedule, cancel appointments, and I just had to lock myself up. And I went out when I had that breakthrough. I, it was literally such a strong spirit of prayer that I couldn't even function. I mean, it wasn't like I was a hypochondriac or psychologically I was crazy. I just, it was like a weight was on my soul. And if it wasn't for me reading books by John Hyde and Charles Finney and others, I would have thought I was going crazy. But I already knew that this is the kind of prayer that gives breakthrough, that precedes revival, that these men and women uh, of history have walked in this. So that's what kept my sanity. So that spirit of prayer was on me. And I remember, uh, you know, I knew I was praying for New York because that was right before 9-11. I, I was praying for the city. I was praying for revival. Of course, I was praying for all of that. But I didn't know everything I was praying for. And I remember about a year and a half into this thing, I said, God, what in the world is going on here? What, what, what am I praying about? And the Lord said, you just exchanged devils. Because I'd come into the kingdom message in 1995. I didn't know what I was walking into. And I had been commanded by God to write the book, Ruling the Gates, in 1998. And the Lord said, I'm taking you out of hiding. And you're going to start preaching this all over the world. But you're not ready. And I'm getting you ready. And so it was almost like God had to give me the ability spiritually to go to a whole nother level so that I could handle the enormous pressure. I mean, like if you ever went scuba diving, you have to go under the water very slow, otherwise you'll get the bends. You'll get bubbles in your skin and you can die because your, your body has to adjust to the, the pressure gradually. If you go down too fast, you could die. So what God was doing was he was getting me ready for more atmospheric pressure. And uh, after that, the spirit of prayer, you know, I broke through January 2nd, uh, 2000. And, uh, and I started living somewhat of a normal life again, but then five, six, seven years ago, it just started again. It just, I mean, I can't describe the kind of life I live. It would be a little odd, but um, I just spent a lot of time in prayer. That's all I can tell you. And uh, when I uh, go to places, I always have about 50 high-level intercessors that I tell them detail about, that I know can handle this kind of thing, and they pray for me. Because I know that, you know, if I'm trying to do this thing alone, I'm going to get my butt kicked. And I try to solicit people who have a prophetic gift and who are intercessors to get on my personal list, and I'll give them texts whenever I'm going somewhere, and they'll sometimes give me words or whatever. And then we have a whole armor bearers team in our local church, and of course, I pray a lot myself, and my wife prays, obviously. Um, but I just want you to understand something. If we think that we're going to just preach right doctrine or preach the kingdom and all these things are going to change, think again. There are great theologians who have been preaching this stuff for years. But if you don't have, if you just have great theology, but you don't have power, you don't have authority, <clears throat> You don't have spiritual power. 
It's not going to do anything. Amen. And when he sees somebody who's activating this kind of thing and shifting the church, shifting the thinking of the church, let me tell you something. There's a lot of war that takes place. I remember one of the first times I went to Africa. And um, in the middle of the night, I had this vision of these idols with laugh, laughing at me, saying, ha, 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 so you think you're going to come here to preach this and we're going to leave you alone? Ha, 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 you are not going to preach this here. I got up and I had a spirit of fear on me. And my wife was sleeping and I left her alone and I just started praying in tongues and travailing. It took me a few hours till I broke through, but I realized that there was some heavy duty principalities that were very upset. And then I started for the next three years preaching over 2,000 pastors on, on this. So we need to combine everything we ever learned in revival, in fasting, in holiness. You never throw that stuff out. Everything we learned in, in the old classical, we don't learn this nowadays in the church, unfortunately, the way we should. Maybe it is, uh, uh, there is a remnant that does flow in the power of God. There's no question. A remnant, a lot of my friends fasting and praying and all that. But the old time classical Pentecostals, man, they wait on God for hours. They fast and pray. They, and, and of course, in Africa, they have all night prayer. Every Friday night, a lot of churches, every Monday night, Friday night. So, you know, we don't throw that out the window. You just combine it with the gospel of the kingdom. And when we do that, all hell will take notice. I want to be known in hell, not just in heaven. Acts 19, demons said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? If your name is only written in heaven, you're not doing your job. If you're known in hell, you're doing it. I'm telling you, when you start preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you're probably already known in hell because of the great work you're doing, but you'll be even more of a threat because the great things you're already doing will be combined with a more robust yes, understanding of the kingdom. It'll go to another level. So I'm honored to be with you. I know God is doing great, great things. I'm so excited for the children of Bishop Victor and Judith, hearing this, I wish I heard this when I first got saved. Oh, my God. 17 years of my life. But God used it because I understand that side. But, man, can you imagine if I knew people were being taught this from when they're five, six, seven years old? Can you imagine if we start teaching our spiritual children this stuff? The kind of world we're going to have in one or two generations. Amazing. So why don't we pray? Father, we thank you. Everybody who wants to walk in the power of the kingdom, let me just, just stand up. Let's just make a commitment to God. Not just in signs and wonders, but in the word of the kingdom. So, Father, we just thank you. You know, the Lord is just reminding me of something I was going to say. I forgot to say it before I pray. You know, the book of Esther doesn't mention the name of God once. How many know that? That's why the Jews, a lot of the Jews didn't want to put it in the Hebrew canon. But when you read that book, God is all over that book. And what that book tells us is that sometimes prayer alone is not enough. Sometimes repentance is not enough. The church is just, we, we do our repentance, we do our prayer, but in the book of Esther, to save the life of the Jews, they had to change the law. They had to have access to power. And they fasted, they prayed, they repented, but then they went to the king. God has called the church to have access to power again. The prophets Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, all of these prophets were able to speak truth to the leaders in the gates of their nation and the nations. We have to not only have church prophets who walk in 1 Corinthians 14, 
exhortation, comfort, and review, verse 2 to 4. But we have to have kingdom prophets who walk in the power of the Old Testament prophets who prophesy to kings. I believe that God is raising up even in the midst of you, especially the young people. They're going to be kingdom prophets that are going to articulate the word of the Lord. They're going to go to leaders of culture, leaders of society, not only political leaders, but people that are in a celebrity status, pop culture leaders. They're going to be people that are going to walk in the word of the Lord, and they're going to be able to change culture the way Daniel was able to give Nebuchadnezzar a word of the Lord, and he was able to repent and honor the God of, of Israel. Um, if Daniel did not have access to power, he could have never got to Nebuchadnezzar. We have to train our kids to have access, to be gatekeepers. It's not enough just to prophesy in the church. We want to change culture. Our kids have to be leaders of leaders. They have to walk in the gates. So I'm just prophesying right now. This is definitely not something I knew I was going to do. And so, like the book of Esther, and I feel like all the young people in this room need to study the book of Esther and the book of Daniel, those two books. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, you will find the kingdom all over there. And it will give you an amazing glimpse of how God will raise you up. Now, God is not religious. I want you to know that. We've been so religious, we can't even speak truth to power. I teach my kids, think biblically, but speak secularly. Most Christians are so religious, they can never get their foot in the door in politics or in culture. They only know how to quote scripture, speak in tongues, and prophesy. That was one of the things that I was a rocker. I was going to make my living as a professional studio guitar player. I was on my way to making it big. I was supposed to play in Madison Square Garden at 17. The thing that stopped me from coming into the church was the religiousness of the people. I would ask somebody for directions in the church because I would visit the church. And I would say, oh, how do you get to McDonald's? Hallelujah. I'm thinking, what? I am not going to become one of these religious fanatics. And even now when I preach, I never say amen. I'm sick and tired of the religious words. And every other word out of some preachers, hallelujah, amen. That's okay for your religious audience. But if you want to start reaching young people, you want to reach unchurched people, you want to reach people who are going to be secular leaders, you have to learn to speak the language of culture. Not that it's wrong to say hallelujah in church. Obviously, you're worshiping God. It's okay and all that. There's a context for everything. If you just would believe is, you know, you speak in tongues, obviously. But when you are in a service... On Sunday, and you've got a mixed crowd, you want to attract people, you have to learn how to speak without compromising the spirit, words that are not going to have these cultural barriers to the young people. You hear what I'm saying? I'm able to preach the word of God without shouting hallelujah. You didn't hear me say hallelujah or amen once when I was teaching. Even I said amen to explain a point, but I don't have to say that to communicate. So we have to also understand how to be like that in a way of reaching out to kids. And when our kids are being trained to be gatekeepers, we have to teach them to think biblically. Everybody say, think biblically. Think biblically. Speak secularly. Speak secularly. It doesn't mean you cuss. It means that you're speaking their language. You become experts in the words they use so that they know what you're talking about. And so I feel very, very, very strongly that the young people in this room have to read the book of Daniel and the book of Esther. And I really believe, you know what? As a matter of fact, I want all the young people to come up here. My heart is for these young people. I want us to pray for them now. If I came all the way down here from New York just for them, to me it would be worth it. Now, what I'd like us to do 